Welcome into the Sunday morning sermon for Sunday, August the 16th. I'm Pastor Chris Driggs of Bolivia Baptist Church. And today we continue the series that I started a couple of weeks ago entitled Dear Church, looking at the seven churches in the book of Revelation. We're going to be in Revelation 2, 12 through 17. Up to this point, we have looked at the church at Ephesus, which was the church that had left its first love, and we discover we need to keep first things first, and that sometimes our priorities can get wrong and uh, get a little worldly, and we need to get back to Jesus. Then we looked at the church at Smyrna, which was the persecuted church, the one church that Jesus doesn't say anything negative about because they were going through such great persecution, and we discovered how to stand strong in the face of persecution. And I talked about how I believe we have persecution coming our way. We're starting to see that in our culture. We're starting to see a... Uh, 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 an an anti-Christian sentiment uh, in our culture here in the United States, something that's really been going on in a lot of places around the world already. Well, today we're going to look at the letter to the church at Pergamum and discover the importance of not only being familiar with the Word of God, but heeding it. There was a businessman once who was kind of known for being really ruthless, and he announced to writer Mark Twain that he was going to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land before he died. And he says, I'm going to climb to Mount Sinai and read the Ten Commandments aloud at the top. Well, Twain, kind of tongue-in-cheek, replied, I have a better idea. You could stay in Boston and keep them. (laughs) Evidently, he was having problems with keeping them. Uh, Perhaps Twain had 1 Samuel 15, 22 in mind, which says, To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. A lesson for the church at Pergamum and for us today as well. Well, let's read in Revelation 2, begin with verse 12 today, and let's look at the church at Pergamum. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have There are some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Pergamum was a city set on a hill. It means citadel, which was a fortress on high ground. It was considered to be the capital of Asia at that time, and was the center of the Asian kingdom area starting in the 3rd century B.C. It was a cultural center with a theater. It was a pagan city with multiple deities, and it was a political city with the main worship being the worship of the emperor of Rome. It was a prominent and strategic city. In his greeting, as before, Jesus describes himself in a specific way that fits the church. Remember, at Ephesus, he was the one who walked among them and could evaluate their deeds. In Smyrna, he was the first and last and the one resurrected from the dead, which we found was comforting for the church members who faced possible death for their faith. In Pergamum, we're told in verse 12, he's the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now we see that back in Revelation 1.16 where it says in his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. The sword referred to here is the long sword known as the Thracian sword. Uh, the, the Thracians were a group of people that existed around 300-400 BC. The sword they developed and used was somewhat long, not extremely long, but somewhat long and curved at the end which made it still suitable for close combat. For Jesus, the imagery of the sword coming from his mouth is of his judgment that needs only be spoken against those who are not walking with him. Thus, it comes from his mouth. Just as he spoke creation into existence, he can speak judgment, and it'll happen. Since the weapon specified is suitable for close combat, it may be that the judgment is directed toward those who think they're close to him, even though they may not be. It also could point to a quick, unexpected judgment. A secondary way of looking at this sword is that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, according to Ephesians. And since this sword is coming out of his mouth, 
then the judgment of God is based on his already revealed word, the Bible. Indeed, God judges us based on his word. The Bible says Jesus is the word made flesh and that all of humanity will be judged based on their acceptance or rejection of Jesus, the word. For the Christian, we're blessed when we walk with the Lord and if we fail to walk with him, particularly for a long time or in open defiance, we are subject to his discipline based on the truth of his word. Now, he doesn't just hand that right out. He's a patient God with us. But he may discipline us ways that at first we don't even recognize or notice, and then it gets stronger and stronger. So while saved, we as members of his church are subject to the judgment of his sword. As we've talked about in our Habakkuk Bible study, judgment begins with the household of God. And I just want to comment on some things that I've, I've commented on before, but, you know, today some churches want to talk about grace but not discipline. They believe that grace covers everything, and it does, and that we no longer have to concern ourselves with pleasing God because he's always pleased with us simply because we are his. Well, the Bible teaches something different. I know that sounds right, and it sounds good, and it makes us feel good that, hey, I can get away my sin with my sin. I'm, it's carte blanche. I can do whatever I want, and because of grace, God just has to forgive me. And he does forgive us, I'm not saying he doesn't. But it's his love that's eternal. Just as parents always love their children simply because they're our children, all right? He loves us simply because we're his. But aren't there times that our children do things that disappoint and even anger us? And what do we do with that? Well, hopefully we discipline them so they can mature. Likewise, as God's children, we disappoint and even anger God. Some don't think that's possible anymore. They think God's never angry with you. He's always accepting of you. He doesn't get upset with you. I want to tell you something. Sin bothers God, period. It bothers him, even in his children. In fact, I think, it, as we talked about, judgment begins with the household of God. I think it bothers him more with his children because we should know better. We should be walking in his spirit that he has blessed us with. And when we're not, and we're just abiding this thing, well, grace has got me covered. Grace has got me covered. Paul said it. Should I go on sinning that grace may abound? No, absolutely not. We see it with the Hebrew children in the Old Testament. When they would stumble, God would discipline, sometimes very harshly. But rather than forsaking us, his grace leads him to discipline us so we can mature as Christians. It's always a work of love. All right, It's always a work of love. You don't lose your salvation, but he wants to grow you to be more like him. And if we're stumbling and if we're falling repeatedly over and over and over again, he's going to discipline us to straighten us out. Those who teach grace without also teaching Christians to be disciplined wind up having a church full of baby Christians. And babies have to be constantly entertained or be the center of attention. Otherwise, they start to whine and cry and complain. That's what the Hebrew people did, right? In the wilderness especially. And that's what we get in some churches today. Immature Christians who are captured by the entertaining aspects of the church they attend or the prominence or power they can enjoy in the church that they don't have in any other area of their lives. But because that's what they're looking for, that's what they want out of it, they never grow to know the depths of God. And because of that, Christians are easily led astray by teachings that sound good, but have no biblical merit. We're going to find the church at Pergamum struggling with obedience because they're trapped between the Christian life of discipline and the life of entertainment, power, and sensuality that's in the culture around them. We're going to find that some promoted the mixture of the two, even in the church. But first, Jesus starts with a compliment in verse 13. I know where you dwell. He knows them. He knows where they are. Where Satan's throne is. That means they live in a place where Satan's activity is very prominent. He's not saying they are personally placing themselves there. He said, you're living in a town where Satan's throne is. Pergamum was a tough place to be a Christian because of the emperor worship I've already mentioned. Uh, failure to worship the emperor was treason and punishable by death. There was also a temple to Zeus in Pergamum. And they also worshipped Serapium, the ancient Egyptian god of the underworld. And just saying underworld kind of gives you a tie to Satan there. So according to Jesus, worshipping any other god than Jehovah is devil worship. He says, And you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. So they hold fast my name. In other words, they're 
refusing, for the most part, most of them are refusing to say Caesar is Lord. Instead, they're holding to Jesus is Lord. And that's likely the true contrast here because by the second century AD, after the writing of all of this, uh, they actually have a temple to the Roman Emperor Trajan in Pergamum, and they do the emperor worship in the temple. And so it was really prominent there. Now this Antipas they mentioned, clearly he's a martyr. He says, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Uh, this is a little chilling, so be prepared for that. He was the first martyr in Asia. And it said he was slowly roasted to death in a bronze life-sized bull. Now let that sink in for just a moment. Roasted to death in a bronze life-size bull. You understand what that means, right? This was exceedingly cruel. These were very evil and wicked people. This reveals to us, should reveal to us, what kind of city Pergamum was. What kind of people were living there around these Christians all the time. I mean, he wasn't being roasted over an open fire where he was set on fire. He was being cooked inside of something, so he slowly felt the heat, and he cooked while alive. I know that's kind of gross to think about. Makes you sick, doesn't it? But that's what happened. If, 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 if what we have put out there is correct, that's what is happening. And so it was probably a, a pagan act of worship and sacrifice to their God. It was likely done in a pagan temple where Satan dwells. Jesus says that according to him. It's thought Antipas was martyred because he kept witnessing to the pagans directly, despite their threats. How difficult it must have been, right, for a faithful Christian in Pergamum when there were people like that around him willing to do something like that. You know what? It would have been so easy and so logical to be pagan in public and worship Jesus in private. It's what many do in the church today. Act one way at their job and another way at church, right? But this was a strength in this church. Most of them were not denying the name of Jesus by saying Caesar's Lord, and they were not denying the name by hiding their faith when in public. But there was a problem, and it seems to be in the church. We get to verse 14, and we find out he, he said, I have a few things against you, and it really is one major one. You hold to the teaching, some hold to the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit acts of immorality. And then he goes on to verse 15 and mentions the Nicolaitans, which we have already seen in the church at Ephesus. We talked about they were compromisers. And so what he's saying is, in a sense, the Nicolaitans are a modern version of what Balaam was doing back in the Old Testament. Balaam is back in Numbers 22 through 25. You should go to that and read it at some point. Uh, he was a prophet. And Balak, the Moabite king, tried to get Balaam to prophesy against Israel. But remember, if you know the story, God sent an angel to stop him and allowed his donkey to speak to him and, and, and tell him what he was about to do was wrong. Now, God stopped him from prophesying against Israel, but Balaam ultimately advised the Midianite women, other pagan women, how to lead Israel astray. And you know how they did it? By inviting them to worship their gods. The women enticed the men, drew them in, and then said, worship my God with me. And when the Israelites started joining in, God judged them. Listen, God judged them by sending a plague among them, killing 24,000. And you thought the COVID was bad. <laughs> now this teaching in Pergamum isn't exactly the same, but the intent is. And the result was heading that way. There are some in the Pergamum church who are causing other Christians to stumble. They're teaching that it's okay to engage the culture and be a part of the culture and still be a child of God. In verse 15 again, Jesus speaks of the Nicolaitans. The Ephesian church hated their deeds, but the Pergamum church was tolerating it. Some were embracing it. Some were tolerating it. So Pergamum is a compromising church. They want to be Christians, but some in the church want to fit with the culture and, and are being and, and tolerated and are being tolerated by others who don't. 
In other words, what I'm saying is some of them want to fit in with the culture. They're teaching that it's okay in the church, and others are letting them teach that in the church without coming against it. Some not only are participating in pagan rituals, but encouraging their brothers and sisters to do the same, putting stumbling blocks before them. Of course, Jesus has just complimented the faithful for not compromising, but they're allowing the compromisers to stay and be an influence. So the concern Jesus has is who are they listening to? Who are they obeying? Are they heeding his word or the word of the compromisers? Listen, church, the word of God is exclusive. We cannot mix in pagan, pagan worldly ideologies or other religious practices and form some sort of pseudo-Christianity. Jesus exclaimed exclusivity when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but my me. God commanded exclusivity in the Ten Commandments. You should have no other gods before me. And here in Revelation, Jesus calls other gods representative of Satan. Bowing down to them is devil worship. So genuine Christianity is the exclusive worship of God and God alone. It's dependent upon believing God and his word and obeying it. If we're heeding the word of God, then we'll refuse to accept or tolerate any other teaching, any other lifestyle, or any other culture. Even if the culture's telling us we should tolerate it, Jesus says differently. We'll refuse to mix Christianity with the culture or anything else that can water it down because to do so is defiance. We're either devoted to God exclusively or we're not truly devoted. This doesn't mean the culture doesn't affect us. By that I mean the culture will certainly influence us at times and cause us to stumble. However, we cannot give in to the culture, worship what the culture worships, and idolize the things of the culture. And as we see here with the Pergamon Church, we can't allow members to lead others toward idolatry of any kind. There are so many forms of idolatry in our country right now that if I listed them all, every one of you watching right now would be in dismay for yourselves by the time I was done because one of them would hit you somewhere along the way. So I encourage you to pray and let God show you what has become a substitute in your life. Which leads me to verse 16. He says, Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. They are called to repent because what they're doing was sin. They were church members called to repent of being a compromiser or of tolerating compromisers and letting them influence other church members. Listen, God still sees the sin of the Christian. His grace and forgiveness are forever, but his desire for us to walk rightly is not to be overlooked. Jesus says, I'm coming to you quickly. I don't think this is referring to his second coming to take us all home. He's telling that church that he, in some form or in some way, will visit them with his judgment. Remember he said that plague and all that? Making war, he says, with the compromisers with his sword. He'll expose them, shame them, discipline, discipline them, and perhaps even cut them off from the fellowship in order to protect the rest of the church. That's church discipline. We see that in the book of Matthew. We see it spoken of by Paul as well in Corinthians. Listen, this is a tough teaching, and I get it. Can you imagine being the pastor of the church at Pergamum and reading this letter to the congregation? As some say in our culture today, I'm sure some of the people were triggered and felt like they needed a safe space, for sure. Well, verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will, make him, I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. They listened, but did they hear? If they heard, they would repent. Repent of their pseudo-Christianity that allows for idolatry to go unchecked and even promoted in the church. True Christianity, listen, true Christianity turns its face toward God and only faces toward the world in order to turn them to Jesus. We only look to the world in order to take Jesus to the world. The rest of the time we are to take our cues in life from the Lord. For example, the world teaches independence and self-sufficiency. God's word teaches dependence on him, trusting him for our basic needs. When we believe that our needs are solely up to, up to him to meet, or, or so, so, uh, sorry, let me say that again. When we believe that our needs are solely up to us to meet, 
It's on me to do it. That's when I've stepped away from God. So if we have ears to hear, we'll turn away from our idols and ideologies and heed only the word of God. Now, at the end of each letter, he gives a promise it will be true for all Christians, but I think he gives it to remind us that no matter what we face in this world, and even when we fail him, we will still be rewarded for having him as our Savior. This reward is guaranteed to all who really believe, even if they stumble and fall. Here he promises the hidden manna. The manna was heavenly food in the Old Testament for the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness. The fact here that it's hidden means it has yet to be revealed. It's something that will come later. I think it's the provision of heaven itself that has yet to be revealed to us that we're going to receive when we get there. This white stone that he talks about, in that day, uh, stones were used like tickets. If you arrived at an event with the right color stone, you could be admitted. The white stone is, is our admission ticket so to speak, into heaven, or more specifically, I think, to the event of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there's a new name written on that stone. It's our heavenly name. All right? Your name will be on your stone reserving your seat at the table. You'll know your new name, but Jesus says no one else will. And I thought about that, and as I looked at that, I go, why? Well, perhaps because no one else really needs to know it. I don't know that we're going to be going around speaking each other's name in heaven we're going to be speaking the name of Jesus in praise and worship around the throne. And I don't know that we need to know each other's name. We're in heaven. I think our relationship will be, go beyond the need for that. I think this new name is something that's between us and God that says something to us about how God feels about us and how we are to relate to him for all of eternity. I don't know that for sure. I'm speculating a little bit. Uh, but that's just kind of where I'm at on that. So as I wrap this up, you and I are children of God who are guaranteed a place at the table with Jesus. Nothing can take that away from us, even our disobedience. But that doesn't mean Jesus is pleased when we live any way we like and allow for idols in our lives or in our church. He loves us, but it doesn't mean he's pleased with us when we do that. The call today to this church and to us is to heed the word of God and repent of anything that takes us on a different path. God's serious about this, serious enough that he was willing to do something in the church at Pergamum to protect those who were walking rightly with him. He says, I'll make war with you. That's a pretty serious statement. Listen, Jesus loves you and wants you to love him above all things. That means heeding his word and not allowing ourselves to follow after the ways of the world. In a Peanuts comic strip, Sally, a rarely seen character in Peanuts, but there, was struggling with her memory verse for Sunday. She was absorbed in her thoughts, trying to figure it out when she remembered maybe it was something from the book of re-evaluation. <laughs> re-evaluation. Of course, she meant revelation. Uh, and of course, she never did find the memory verse because she was looking for re-evaluation. But we should learn to always read the Bible with the intent of re-evaluating our attitudes and our actions to make sure they're in line with the truth of God's Word. Let's pray together. Father, help us to be reevaluators. Help us to be people uh, that look and say, and stop, that, that, that look at ourselves rather than just looking at everybody else, that, that instead of pointing the fingers so much, we're looking at ourselves continually and making sure we're clean and making sure we're pure and making sure we're holy. And God, it's not all the, about doing that constantly. We can rest and abide in your grace, yes, but Lord, may we be people that discipline ourselves to godliness as your word tells us to do so that you don't have to step out and do it for us and it's lord it's not about uh, it, it's it's not about our relationship with you and we've destroyed it that's not the point you still love us no matter what but god you have left us here to be witnesses for you and unless we're disciplined and walking in you lord we can't be that so lord show us our failures don't allow us to feel extreme guilt and shame for that, but just enough to bring us to repentance. Help us to not abide in that. Once we've repented, help us to let it go like you've let it go and to move forward. But God, if there's something we're repeating over and over and over again, God, convict us. Help us to feel that burden and that shame that you feel so that we can repent and turn back to you and be the witnesses you've called us to be. God, thank you for your letter to the church at Pergamum. Thank you for showing us how we can sometimes compromise with the world and try to 
be Christians in one place while not being evidently Christians in other places. God, forgive us for that and help us to walk rightly with you is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining me. I hope that you'll join Mike for Midweek with Mike on Wednesday. Uh, don't forget members of Bolivia Baptist Church. Uh, today is your last day to uh, get in a deacon nomination. We're actually counting those after the worship service today. Uh, but if you have not got it in and you get one to me, you know, a couple hours after wa after our service is out, I could count that. If, if you've beyond that, it's, it's a little too late. We've got to, got to move forward with that. We will have our annual meeting on August 30th in the evening time. We'll let you know the time of that if you're able to come. Well, God bless you, and I hope you have a wonderful week.